Bob Drury, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me. So you co-authored a book called Lucky 666. It's this incredible story. How did you learn about this story of a bunch of ragtag airmen who flew an impossible mission during World War II? Believe it or not, Brett, it was from a friend of mine now, a grizzled old Marine, Dick Benelli. And he was a protagonist in a previous book that Tom and I wrote together called The Last. It was about the Chosen Reservoir in, during the Korean War, The Last Stand of Fox Company. And Dick and I just became friends. Uncle Dickie, he told me to call him. And we still speak every couple of weeks. He's in his 90s now. And Tom and I were working on a book about the 11 Marine security guards who were mistakenly left on the embassy roof in Saigon in 1975. And Uncle Dickie called me. He said, what are you working on next? That's how he spoke. That's how he still speaks. And I said, I don't know, Dick. We're kind of searching around. We got a few ideas. And as you probably can imagine, Marines are not very fond of the Army. But he said, I got a story for you. I can't believe I'm saying this about the Army. Would you ever hear about these guys, the longest dogfight of World War II? And I said, no, Dick, what are you talking about? And he gave me some information, and I started poking around into it. And this magnificent story just, it, it appeared before us. And as we dug further into it, we realized it wasn't just about this dogfight. It was about the entire Southwest Pacific Theater, how ignored it was, the infighting between the Army and the Navy, between MacArthur and Chester Nimitz. And we just knew we had something. And to this day, I thank Uncle Dickie for turning me on to Lucky 666. <laughs> well, so before we get to the, 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 the two characters, the, the main characters you follow in this book, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole host of characters, but the two is Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnowski. Let's get some background of the book, because as you said, the, this theater of war is often overlooked when people think about World War II. I mean, there's everyone always talks about Normandy and Europe and then, you know, certain parts of the Pacific, Guadalcanal, Midway. Let's talk about what was going on. Where did this book p take place and what role did it play in the war? Well, let me give you a little background, Brett. Believe it or not, w within months of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Empire controlled one-eighth of the Earth's surface. Now, granted, a lot of that was ocean, but... They were so ready to fight and they, and they just spread in the West. They were on the Burmese Indian border and due South from there, they had taken the Dutch East Indies. If you went Northwest, they had a large chunk of China and even briefly a couple of the Aleutian Islands. And then if you curve South from there, they had the Solomons. And in other words, they were girding Australia and everybody expected Australia to be next. But our policy, President Roosevelt's policy and the War Department's policy was Germany first. So what little resources we had in the Pacific and in specifically in the Southwest Pacific were basically MacArthur and Chester Nimitz were told, hold off the Japanese until we take care of the Nazis. 85% of all material, men, Grounds crews went to Europe, Germany first. And so these, these airmen who were in Australia and eventually made it to Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, they weren't content with just playing defense. And believe it or not, Australia had a secret plan. They were going, they were, they so expected to be invaded that they had a plan to cede the top half of the continent to the Japanese and hold out in Melbourne and Sydney. And so that, that's the background of where our characters, this is the world our characters in Lucky 666 stepped into. Kind of forgotten, half-assed, they, they didn't get the material they needed, and they were told, just try to put up a good fight until we can help you out after we defeat Hitler. And all, I mean, also, they weren't getting the materials they needed, but like the material they had, a lot of it was decimated at Pearl Harbor. E exactly. And the planes that they managed to get out of the Philippines— the, the B-26 Marauders mostly, a couple of B-17 Flying Fortresses, and any planes that they already had in Australia, that's all they were getting. I mean, it was official policy. We cannot send you any more planes. So uh, a fun part of the research of this book was just talking to – there were still a few guys alive when we were researching the book, but their sons and their nephews, they all had letters saying – these guys were going up and there was no troops on the ground in Australia. There was not even any Australian troops. They were all fighting in North Africa under the under Montgomery, the British general. And so it was just airmen. 
And the Navy was loath to give MacArthur any of their ships. He wanted them all, of course. So he had this ragtag group of airmen. And the planes they had were the only planes they were getting. They did not have grounds crews. They had to act as their own ground crews. And a lot of them became not only ace pilots and bombardiers and turret gunners and tail gunners, but they became mechanics and maintenance men. And they were going up, they were patched, they were hammering out soup cans to patch the bullet holes in their, in their bombers. They discovered that the Australian sixpence coin was, it fit perfectly in the ignitions magneto of a B-17. Believe it or not, they even, when they ran out of air filters, they would women, they would use women's sanitary napkins. I remember one, one letter we wrote, one guy preferred Kotex over any other plan over any other brand because it works so well as an air filter. And this is just, I say this by way of the Rube Goldberg-esque nature of the fifth air force, the forgotten fifth, they were called. Of course, over in Europe, there was the mighty eighth air force and that got all the ink and all the reporters and all the maintenance crews and all the, the backup parts and the forgotten fifth down in Australia, they had to make do with whatever they could find. And believe it or not, they did. And they did a, re- a very good job of it. Right. Not only were them like the, their planes terrible and sort of the, the, the stuff that was left over, but like the food, like the, I think one of the generals went over there to do an inspection and he saw there's like maggots in the rice and like <laughs> just disgusting. They were eating it because that's all they had. That's all they had. There was a protein. That was their protein, lice and maggots. And then when they finally, now people, I'll probably have to explain where Port Morrisby is. The Japanese were planning to invade Australia from a base in New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. And they had landed and they had set up a couple bases in the north of the country. And it's a big country. In the south, on a little peninsula, there was an air base. It was an old Australian air base. The U.S. took it over and it was a hellhole. It was surrounded by jungle. There were usually more people in sick bay than there were air crews ready to go up. Dysentery ran rapid, malaria, the jungle itch, they called it. And this is where they, this is where our men, our boys, our flyboys were stationed. And the Japanese bombed them every single day because in order to invade Australia, they had to invade Australia. They had to drive the Americans out of Port Morrisby. And finally, MacArthur and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I just want to set up the scene. MacArthur, of course, he wanted to be the Eastern Ike. He wanted, if Eisenhower was running Europe, MacArthur and his gargantuan ego, he wanted to run the Pacific War. But the Navy, believe it or not, had been planning, even though they were surprised at Pearl Harbor, they had been planning for a war against Japan for decades. And they said, no, all this planning, we're not turning it over to MacArthur. We're not turning it over to any other service. We know what we want to do. And of course, they eventually carried it out. It was the famous island hopping campaign led by Chester Nimitz and Bull Halsey, where they took one island and then the next and the next and the next. But in order to kind of solve the turf war between MacArthur and Nimitz, instead of making one man the supreme commander in the Pacific, the War Department, George Marshall, FDR, they kind of drew a line, almost went right down the Solomon Islands. Everything to the west was MacArthur. And that would be uh, Australia, New Guinea, and everything to the east, all the islands that we took, with them, that the Marines took, that was Nimitz. So MacArthur is chafing, A, that he does not have complete control of the Pacific War, and B, that he has no troops. And at one point, he put forth a plan to dissolve the Marine Corps and make those troops army under him. And of course, you can imagine how well that went over with the Marine Corps and with the Navy. So this war within the war almost hampered the efforts, the coordination efforts that we had against the Japanese at the time. Now, this early in the war, I might be I might be overstating it when I say coordination effort, because as I said before, it was just the plan was hold Australia until we defeat Germany. Please hold Australia. But these these airmen, they weren't content to hold Australia. And in New Britain, at the top of the Solomon Islands, the best harbor in the Pacific was at Rabul. New Britain was an island. Rabul was the capital of the island. That's where the Japanese set up their air base. Now, we could not reach that Rabul to bomb it from Australia without refitting and refueling at Port Morrisby. 
it was 500 miles from Port Moresby, which is why we had to take over the base at Port Moresby so we could fly our, at first our B-26 Marauders. And finally, the when we, they did get some shipments of the B-17 Flying Fortress. So a thousand mile round trip, you couldn't have fighter escorts. Fighters couldn't carry enough fuel to fly that far. And these guys started taking the war against Washington's orders almost to the Japanese. They started looking for convoys to bomb. They started to see how many planes they could get into Rabul and out of Rabul. Now, sometimes it wasn't worth it. They might, they might send up a bombing run of, say, 12 B-17s, and only eight would make it back. Two might have been shot down, and two more might have had to ditch into the sea. But they decided that they were going to go on the offensive no matter what the War Department thought. And not only were they just going to defend Australia, but they're going to strike back against the Japanese. I know that was a long answer. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Well, and so we, the state of the, the U.S. military in the Pacific was, okay, resources scarce because it's all going to Europe. Sort of the ragtag of, of the military was sent to the Pacific. And there was this conflict between Nimitz and MacArthur. What was the Japanese military like? Where what were they? I mean, were they really organized, disciplined? Yes. Yeah. Give us. Yes, they they knew they knew from from the very beginning. They said we first of all, the, their first misstep was not taking out, not attacking Pearl. Our aircraft carriers just happened to be out of the harbor at the time. If our aircraft carriers had been in the harbor at the time, the war in the Pacific might have been over then and there. But once they realized damn, the U.S. still has its carriers. We have to make quick work of this. We cannot give the giant United States time to refit all its factories and all its manufacturing base for a war footing. And they knew this. So they needed to conquer as much as possible, as fast as possible. And that was the whole Australia gambit. Once we take Australia, Pearl Harbor and the Hawaiian Islands are a hop, skip, and a jump away, the United States will be forced to sue for peace. That was the Japanese point of view. And on the other hand, as I explained, our point of view is we cannot let Australia fall. As long as Australia is a bulwark against Hawaii and the American West Coast, we can go about our business in Europe. So we got to hold off the Japanese at all costs. Right. And again, but again, not only did they, these guys hold them off, they started taking the, the fight to the Japanese. Well, I, you know, it sounds like such a cliche, but when you read the letters and the journals and the diaries from the time, it was kind of good old American ingenuity. We're not going to take this lying down. And let's face it, we got knocked. We got knocked pretty hard to the mat at Pearl Harbor. But Suddenly, there's the Battle of Coral Sea. Suddenly, there's the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. And, of course, Midway. And we realize, hey, these Japanese aren't the, the supermen. Yes, sure, they're fighter planes. The Zeros control the skies. And we don't have fighters that can effectively go up and dogfight these Zeros. But you know what? Our bombers can fly further. Our bombers can carry more of a payload. And, yes, we're not content just to to defend the territory they haven't that we that we already have, which of course at the time consisted of Australia and a few islands like Guam and New Caledonia. And once I think a spurring point might have been the invasion, the Japanese invasion of Guadalcanal. Because once the Japanese were on Guadalcanal, if they had established air bases there, they would have been within easy bombing range of Melbourne and Sydney. And that's when we kind of made the turnaround and it was Nimitz and Halsey said, we got to retake Guadalcanal. And while we're retaking Guadalcanal, we want MacArthur to start putting pressure on the Japanese bases, not only in New Guinea, but all the way up in New Britain. We were going to go after Rabul. Fortress Rabul, it was called. I mean, it was, everybody remembers Fortress Singapore falling on the first day, the same day, the day after Pearl Harbor fell, the British outfit in, in Singapore. But Fortress Rabul was really the key to the, to the Pacific War. And we went after it. And we went after it and it took us years, took us years and years, but we got it. All right. So that's the background of this story. So kind of, it's a, it's a classic underdog story, I think. So let's get to these two characters. First is Jay Zemer. Uh, who was he and what was his background like and how did he end up in Port Moresby? Well, it's like, you know what, you put it well. It, the, the story is almost like peeling an onion. The big picture, the outside picture is what's going on in the Southwest Pacific Theater. The next is the forgotten 5th Air Force, 
and you, the next, you peel the next layer off and you come to the men, the men who are actually flying these missions, these recon missions and these bombing missions. And of course, the protagonist of Lucky 666 is Jay Zemer, kind of a handsome, blonde, upper middle class. Uh, think, I don't know if you've ever seen Starlight 17, think Peter Graves in Starlight 17. He always wanted to be a pilot. He went to a military high school and then he went to MIT where he was in the ROTC and he was in the flight club. He flew Piper Club. And then when war broke out, he signed up with the Army Air Force. Don't forget, there was no Air Force, a separate service at the time. It was the Army Air Force. But there was just something off about Jay. He was affable. Everyone on the ground loved him. He was a great teammate. I think back then, if they had had the diagnosis, he might have been diagnosed as some type of autistic because once he got in the pilot seat, he just continued to screw up. He couldn't, he was, his first plane was a B-26 Marauders and these planes, these bombers, because their engines were so large, they were notoriously hard to take off and land. And Jay just couldn't stick the landing. All his flight instructors who loved him, who loved him as a man and who loved him as a friend and loved him as an airman, but they would like grab the controls from him because he was going to crash land every time he went up. So he could never get out of the, the co-pilot seat, the right seat, they called it. So he's on all these bombing missions and he's in the right seat and weird things are happening. He's falling asleep as they're approaching their target. He just didn't feel he might have been one of those like those kids who are too smart for their grades. <laughs> that might have been Jay, but he just was not happy with the B-26 Marauders. And eventually his squadron became very unhappy with him. They didn't trust him anymore. I said, I can't have this guy sitting next to me. He's going to fall asleep. So they managed to get him to kind of transfer him out. And he went into a unit that was flying B-17 Flying Fortresses. And it was almost the symbiosis between the Flying Fortress and Jay Zemer. Something kicked in. He started as a co-pilot and he learned that the, the B-17 was almost as maneuverable as a fighter plane. And he started to go. And once again, crewman didn't want to fly with him because he was an aggressive. He'd do a bombing run and then he'd start attacking zeros. And his crew, the crews he was with was like, hey, wait a minute. Hold on. We did our bombing run. Let's get the hell out of here. And he said, no, I got, I'm going after that guy down there. So finally, even the B-17 crew said, this guy's crazy. I'm not flying with him anymore. So what did he do? He had no options. If he wanted to get up and fly, he had to go out and find his own crew. And he did. And we'll get to how he, how, how he found his own crew and his own plane here in a bit. But he had a good friend that he met when he signed up with the military and they, they reunited. It's, it's Joe. Tell us about Joe. and his Joe background. Sarnos. Couldn't have been yeah. good, a bombardier. Bombardier by trade. Probably the best. One of the best in the Fifth Air Force. Joe and Jay had been, before they were shipped overseas, they had been stationed together at Langley Air Base in Virginia. And they did not know each other, although they were both born in Pennsylvania. Unlike kind of upper middle class Jay, Joe was one of 16 children of Polish immigrants. His father was a coal miner who was diagnosed with black lung. He bought a small farm. Joe grew up dirt poor. In fact, Joe's first paycheck, he came home at Christmas with gifts for his younger sisters. And it was the first Christmas gifts any of the Sanoski children had ever gotten. So anyway, at Langley Air Base, the brass hats from Washington are coming down. They're putting on an exhibition, a bombing exhibition. They're dropping duds, of course. And they have targets laid out. And Jay's watching. And, of course, the brass at Langley picked out their best crews to put on this exhibition. And the lead bombardier was Joe Sarnowski. And Jay Zemer's watching. This guy hit the target from 10,000 feet from 12,000 feet. And he said, who is this guy? I'm a pilot. I'm supposed to know everything about any plane I fly. If I ever get a B-17, I want to know what makes this bombardier so good. So he sought out. He was an officer. Joe was a staff sergeant at the time. He sought out Joe Sarnowski and he said, hey, listen, can I buy you a beer? And Joe was a little taken aback. Hey, who's this officer coming up to me and asking me to buy a beer? Is this a joke? Is somebody pulling a prank on me? But as it turns out, they became not best friends quite yet, but they came, became very good acquaintances. And Jay, the superior officer, Joe, picked Joe's brain about everything he knew about bomb sites, about targeting, about lead time. So then they separate. 
They both are shipped to Australia, but with different units. Joe spent some time in the North Atlantic. He thought he was going to end up in Europe. He was kind of surprised when he found out that he was going to Australia. He's based in Australia. One day, Jay flies in with his B-17, and here comes his new bombardier in a Jeep. He said, you're Joe Sarnosky. And he said, yes, I am Captain Zimmer. How, how are you? What have you been doing here? So I've been in Australia for three months. And Sarnosky said, I have too. But they have me teaching in the uh, interior. I want to get up on a plane. And Jay said, let me see if I can do something about that. And so Jay basically plucked Joe. Joe was such a good bombardier that they didn't want him up there. They wanted him teaching. Jay plucked Joe and said, I need this man on my crew. And Jay didn't even have a crew. That was the beauty of it. <laughs> he said, I need this man on my crew. And Jay didn't even have his own crew. So Joe was the first man. And just so happened that the next day they were calling for volunteers for a recon mission over Lei, which is, was a Japanese base, L-A-I, Lei, was a Japanese base in northern New Guinea. And Jay said, I'll take that. And he said, Joe, you want to go? And Joe said, I'd love to. Let's load up some bombs. Let's drop some bombs on them while we're reconning. They did it. They hit the target. They came back. And Joe and Jay kind of looked at each other and a light bulb went off over their head saying, you know, we, we work well together. Let's find some other crewmen like us. I don't know where we're going to get a plane, but let's get the crew first and then we'll worry about the plane. And so, okay, so this partnership arises. And what's interesting is like, it's because that no one really cares about this part of the Pacific, that these guys were able to basically do what, I mean, in a way, do what they wanted, right? Exactly. Exactly. This would have never flown. Half the the antics we kind of write, Tom and I kind of write about it at Lucky 666, would never have happened. You'd be in the brig if you did this kind of stuff in the European theater of war. But the Pacific was such a vast theater of war, and our resources were so few that you could get away with a lot more in the Pacific. You could get away. I mean, there were, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, in, in the European theater of war and in the Pacific theater of war, every airman was required to wear the same uniform, the long, the, the overall, the coveralls, the, the flak vest, the helmet. Jay would often go up in a long pair of socks and Australian shorts and, and bush boots. And he was not alone. It was a very, a very loose and lax atmosphere compared to the, the stiffer, more military regulations in the European theater. So when someone like Jay can kind of scam a commanding officer at a, at a, at a, a teaching post into saying, listen, I need this bombardier for my crew when he really doesn't even have a crew. That would never fly in Europe, but it, a lot of that kind of stuff went on in the Pacific theater. So how did Jay form this crew? Because like everyone didn't want to fly with No one wanted to fly with him because he was, he was, no, he, he's using no, a bomber. No, no. He was using a bomber to dogfight, which was crazy. Yeah. And he, t he took too many chances. People would come down and say, I'm never flying with you again. You're nuts. You're crazy. He said, that's fine. I'll find somebody else. And it's exactly what he did. He, Jay was also a storyteller. Joe was a quiet guy and Jay and Joe kind of started this class in his tent and people and crewmen would crewmen of like minds would drop by and they would just sit all night and they would talk. They would talk bombing. They would talk recon. They would talk wind shear. They would talk anything that had to do with military flight. And gradually a circle formed around Jay and Joe. And as you can well imagine, it was kind of an ultra circle. I mean, they're, uh, <laughs> The, their tail gunner, uh, Pudge Pugh, was a Jack LaLanne buff. They called him Pudge, ironically. But you see, we have photos of him in the book. He was, he, he's a big, muscular guy. He looks like Schwarzenegger. He could, be, he could barely fit back, get through the tailpipe to get to his, to get to his gun. Their, their waist gunner, most of the B-17s at the time had two waist gunners who stood back to back. Uh-uh. This, George, George Kendrick, their waist gunner said, these guns are all mine. I'm manning both sides. No one else is coming in here. George had been, had, had worked his way through, had paid his way through college on the West Coast as a pool shark. So they got a pool shark. They got a Jack LaLanne buff, the youngest staff sergeant in the Pacific Theater, Johnny Abel, 19 years old. Great mechanic, but he wants to be a top turret gunner. But mechanics and maintenance crews were so few and far between. His superior was loath to let Johnny Abel go up. He needed him. He needed him to fix these rotors. So finally, Jay pulled rank and he plucked Johnny Abel to become his top turret gunner. I mean, Brett, their, their communications guy, their commo guy was an expert knife fighter. 
Why they figured they needed a knife fighter at 30,000 feet, I never found out. <laughs> but these are the kind of men that gravitated towards Jay and Joe. And before you knew it, they had a crew. Okay, we got a crew. Where's our plane? Well, there's not enough planes to go around. Jay was still co-piloting at the time. Every once in a while, he'd get a pilot's assignment, but for the most part, he was co-piloting. And someone, a colonel said to him, almost half jokingly, sure, you want to go down the boneyard at the end of the uh, runway? That's where they kept all the shot up planes that weren't going up again. You want to fix one of them up? Sure, you can have it. And that's exactly what they did. So that, that, that was old 666. That's the tail number. They found a shot up plane. And the first thing Jay, did, Jay Zemer instructed the crew, he said, listen, we're going to make this plane the fastest in the Pacific theater. So I want you to strip a thousand pounds out of this. I don't care where you find it, but find a thousand pounds. So they just, they were it, everything from, well, you, you can imagine what a piss pipe is. Everything from piss pipes to extra lockers to overhead bins, boom, out the door, out the door. Next, they said, okay, we're going to scrounge every other plane in this boneyard until we get tires, until we get four new engines. They weren't new engines, of course, but they were four engines that worked. And finally, he said, now we're going to make this the most heavily armed plane, not only in the Pacific theater, but perhaps in the world. We're taking out all these little namby-pamby 30-cal machine guns, and we're putting 50-cal machine guns in. And where every other B-17 has one, we're going to put two. And as it turns out, Old 666. They never got around to naming it. You know how uh, you see the war movies uh, and, and they always, Tojo's, dr Tojo's death dream and here comes the bombs. Like They never got around. They were so busy building this plane. They never got around to naming it. And because the last three numbers of its tail numbers were 666, they just took to calling it old 666. They put in 19 50 cal machine guns, including one which Jay he had Johnny Abel hook it up so he could fire it from the steering column in the pilot seat. He called it his schnozola gun. And when they finally passed their flight test, they were indeed the most heavily armed. Most B-17s would carry 13 to 14 guns. Jake carried 19. 17 manned and two. His, his motto was, anything doesn't work, throw it out. Your gun jams, throw it out. We're carrying two extra. Just hook it in. Hook it into the ratchet. And so... Once they pass their flight test, as you can imagine, well, maybe you can't imagine, so I'll explain it to you. They just started volunteering for, for every crazy mission that came down the pike. This crew, they were as regular as the Angelus standing outside the, the, the operations hut every morning. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Where are you going? You got anything for us? And people were more than happy to say, yeah, we need, a, we need somebody to lead a bombing run or a boom. Or we need to see, we understand that there might have been uh, reinforcements brought into lay. We need a, a single recon mission up there. Can you do that? And as it happens, they started to get a reputation. These are the go-to guys. These are the guys we want. When, when the mission looks almost suicidal, let's get Zemer and his crew of eager beavers. They got a nickname, the eager beavers. And that wasn't their only nickname. I mean, if we, we found some magazine articles uh, from the time, that magazine and newspaper articles from the time. And back then, the word screw was kind of a swear word. And yet in every one, these guys were known as the screw ups. These were the screw ups that, you, that would do any mission for you. But half the time you'd have to bail them out of the brakes. That's where they'd be after a bar fight. So they go, they volunteer for all these different missions. Some of them pretty much suicide missions. Tell us about the mission where it was definitely a suicide mission and they engaged in this epic dog fight. That's probably the, the longest that happened in, in World War II. And yeah, this was June, 1943. Now, and, and I wasn't kidding about the brig either. I mean, Jay and Joe were always getting in trouble. <laughs> Jay, at one point, he didn't like the way the crew was eating. And we talked about it before. I mean, the, the food was just horrible. So he made a run. He knew a farmer back in Australia where he had been stationed in Australia. He borrowed a B-17, made a run, filled it up with meat and fresh vegetables, and came back and got caught. They threw him in jail. On another point, he and Joe, there was a, a whorehouse on Rabul that intelligence, American intelligence had figured out the top Japanese admirals and generals were using the top floor of this fancy old hotel as a whorehouse, and they were bringing in geisha girls from Japan to service them. And so Jay and Joe were told, you got to bomb this, this hotel. But they went up twice, and twice Joe disobeyed order. 
Once he bombed a fuel dump and once he bombed an ammunition dump. And both times he came back and he just said, you could throw me in jail, but I'm not bombing no geisha girls. <laughs> So, so they did. They threw him in jail until a reporter found out about it. A reporter for the Associated Press wrote about it, and a general got all upset about it. And I got no, a congressman, a visiting congressman, got all upset about it and got him out of jail. Well, I was going to say to one interesting point with these guys. Sometimes they do these antics, and it looked like they were thrown in jail, but then like later they would get some sort of commendation <laughs> for what yeah, they right. did. They win a silver star for something they had been in the brick. Right. For. <laughs> that's 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 how kind of loose the rules were, especially in the Southwest Pacific. So in June of 1943, Admiral Halsey, he's retaken, his Marines have retaken Guadalcanal, and they're slowly making their way. It's like the mini island hopping up the Solomon Islands, and they're taking every Solomon Island from south to north. The big one at the very top of the chain, Bougainville. It's just south of New Britain, which again is the home to Rabul, Fortress Rabul. If they can, if the allies can get Bougainville under their control and put airstrips in Bougainville, now they're close enough to Rabul for fighter planes to give the bombers air escorts. So Bougainville is the next big, I know we we talk about Midway and we talk about, but Bougainville was one of the unsung fights of World War II. But Halsey A, he knows the Japanese control Bougainville, but he's not quite sure where their strengths lie and what kind of defenses they have. And B, he wants to land his invasion force in Empress Augusta Bay, which is known to have some of the worst and sharpest coral reefs in the world. So he needs a recon flight. A fighter plane won't make it. It can't get that far. It doesn't have enough fuel. They're not going to send up a flight of bombers. They need one bomber to fly. 1,200 miles round trip and take pictures of Bougainville, both where the Japanese defenses are and they had ultraviolet light cameras that would pierce the the bay and show them where the reefs are. So, okay, of course, Jay and Joe, they hear about this and then they're down at the operations hut the next morning and say, yeah, we'll do this. We'll do this. And I got to say for the first time, Jay did go to the crew. And as I've been in a lot of, I've been, I've been a lot, around a lot of military people. War is not a democracy. But for this, this was such a dangerous mission. Jay did go to his crew and explain to every man, listen, I'm, I'm pegging our chances of making this at 25%. And if any one of you doesn't want to go, I understand completely. Joe, just a week earlier, had already gotten his papers shipped back to the States. He was going to become a bombardier instructor in the States. He didn't have to go. And they weren't even carrying bombs. There was no sense having a bombardier. But Joe said, no, I'm not sending you up there. There was going to be somebody in the, in the nose. That's where the bombardier was stationed. He said, I'm not sending you up there with somebody you don't know. I'm going. So Jay and Joe and the crew, they step forward. They go out. They take off. They're taking off at three in the morning. Suddenly a Jeep comes out on the runway, stops, stops their, their plane. Officer runs up to Jay, hands, actually uh, ran up to the waist gunner. Hand him a note. Waste Gunner runs it up to Joe, to Jay in the cockpit. And it says, listen, while you're up there reconning Bougainville, can you also take photos of this little island at the tip of Bougainville, the northern tip? It's called Buka. We know there's an airstrip there. We just don't know how big. We don't know how many enemy planes. What have they got there at Buka? Jay says, no, I'm not doing that. Because in order for these cameras to work, he had to fly at a slow and steady pace. 500 miles per hour at the same, he could, if he tipped a wing a couple of inches, it would throw off the lat long, the latitude and longitude by miles. That's the only way these cameras would work, especially when they were photographing the reefs beneath the water. And he said, if I fly slow and low over Buka, there's a, there's an enemy airfield on, on Buka. There's two on Bougainville. They're going to, why don't you just telegraph them and let me know, let them know I'm coming. So they get there, but what they hadn't counted on is that because they're flying with no bombs or just flying with cameras and they're big tailwind, they arrive an hour early. It's too early for the cameras to work. And so Jay gets on the horn, the interplane radio, and he says, okay, fellas, listen, we got an hour to kill. We can either vector out over the sea and come back when the sun's right for taking pictures, or we can do this buka thing that they want us to do. And everybody voted for Buka. 
So they fly over Buka. Cameras can't work, but they see, they take notes of how many planes are on Buka. Suddenly the tail gunner comes up and says, they're coming up. 12 planes are coming up off Buka after them. But now Jay is still hust. He has, he's got a choice. He can photograph low and slow Bougainville and most especially the Empress Augusta Bay and let those Japanese planes catch him or he can take off. He can run for home. He's already done half his job. He's already found out what's on Buka. And he says, no, if we don't get this film back to them, they're just going to send up another crew. Why put another crew in danger? Let's do this. We're here. So they fly low and slow. And sure enough, the planes from Buka, not, not only the planes from Buka catch him, but two flights come up from Bougainville's air. Now they're surrounded. 44 minutes of a dogfight. They shot down six zeros. Everybody, every crew member, except for Pudge Pew in the tail and the bottom turret gunner is wounded or bleeding out. The plane is shot to hell. Finally, they've been fighting for so long that the Japanese zeros are running out of fuel. That's the only reason they make it back. But they realize we don't have enough. We can't get enough lift to get over the, the mountains to get into Port Morrisby. Plot us a course for Dobodoro, which is on the east coast of New Guinea. He said, I don't know if we're going to make it. We might have to ditch, but we got to get this. It was poignant. And one of the letters to Jay sent to his, to his mother. Yes, it was his mother. And he said, Mom, I realized when I'm on a bombing run, when you drop your rocks, that's what they call the dropping the rocks. When you drop your rocks, if you don't make it home, if you have to make a water landing, or even a crash landing on, before you reach the airfield, at least you have the satisfaction of knowing that you've done your job. You dropped your rocks. But now Jay is saying, if I don't get this film back, this entire mission will be for naught. And just sheer force of will. He's sitting in the cockpit. The cockpit, the whole left side of the cockpit is torn off. He has taken a rocket to the cockpit. The co-pilot is out cold. He doesn't know if the co-pilot's dead or not. And he can look down. And he can see that his left leg looks like hamburger. And he can feel that he's bleeding out. He can feel his boot filling with blood. And suddenly, he looks at his right wrist. And with each heartbeat, blood is spurting out of his right wrist. He's also taking shrapnel there. He turns around. He looks up to Johnny Abel. Johnny Abel tries to drop down from the top turret to help him. Johnny Abel drops down and he realizes he's been shot in both legs and he can't stand up. Suddenly, there's a fire. There's a fire back in the commo room. They go back to the commo room and, and Willie Green, the commo guy, is out. He's taking shrapnel to the neck. He's laying on the ground trying to stop the bleeding from his neck. Johnny Abel puts out the fire with his bare hands, burns his hands. And all the while, because of the rocket that, that blew up there in, in entire cockpit, now Jay can see down right into the nose. And he sees Joe Sarnosky just leaning over his two machine guns puddle of blood around him. He's figuring Joe is dead. He doesn't know for sure, but he's figuring Joe is dead. He's not moving. But his main thought is, I got to get this film back or this entire flight will be for nothing. And sure enough, they make Dobodora, crash land at Dobodora. They're being carried out as the, the, the meat wagon boys. That's what they call the, the medics. The meat wagon guys come. They tear off what's left of the glass around the cockpit. And Jay, who's out Kind of, he looks like he's out cold, but he, he hears a voice say, forget the pilot, get him last, he's dead. And he wants to scream, I'm not dead, I'm alive. But they got him last, he lost half the blood in his body. They were lining up for weeks to, trans, to give him transfusions. And uh, as you well know, Brett, this was the only flight in the history of either the U.S. Army Air Force or the Air Force where two members of the same flight crew were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnosky were both awarded the Armed Military's highest honor. One of them was awarded posthumously. Now, I'm tempted to say to your audience, if you want to find out which one, go buy the book. But if you want to know, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll say, uh, you know, go buy, go buy the book. We'll leave it, it at that. It was Joe. It okay. was Joe who died. Because you know why? I have a... I have a a poignant story. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. No, Jay went through many, many operations, but on the, f oh my goodness, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to cry. On the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, 
Jay was invited back to Pearl Harbor. He was living in Maine at the time and he was invited back to Pearl Harbor uh, for a ceremony. And at one point he was taken to the, the, the punch bowl, which is the giant graveyard there at, in an old extinct volcano. And as far as Jay knew, Joe was buried back in New Guinea. They buried him on the mound. Jay was in a hospital when they buried Joe. He couldn't even, you know, he wasn't even conscious when they buried Joe. But the guys who could walk or could be wheeled out, the crew members who could be wheeled out, they attended the ceremony. They, they buried him under a mound near, near uh, Port Morrisby. And for all Jay knew, Joe was still there. And so he's being escorted into the punch bowl. And a communications officer, by this time he was retired, Colonel, Colonel Zemer, we have something we'd like you to see. And they led him to a grave. And unknown to Jay, previously, 10 years earlier, Joe's body had been dug up and transferred back to the punch bowl. And when Jay saw the headstone and the marker, it wasn't even a headstone, it was a marker, that it was uh, Joe Sarnowski, Jay was on crutches by this point. He put his crutches down and he knelt down and he started crying over the grave. And that's how we end the book. And uh, uh, I know I'm a little speechless. So say something. <laughs> no, no. So it's, it's a great story of, of friendship, of heroism, of grit, determination. I, I'm curious, as you were, wrote this book and you talk to the family members of, of these these guys what did i mean this is the art of manliness podcast what did you learn about being a man after writing about these guys you know brett uh i think you're familiar with my background you know i've been not only do i write military history nonfiction books but for, for, for a good 20 years almost two decades i was a i was a foreign correspondent a war correspondent and, and i was hell holes in afghanistan to iraq to darfur to sarajevo and I think what strikes me the most to answer your specific question is how little it takes, whether it's World War II, whether it's Korea, or whether it's Dashtikala in Afghanistan, how little it takes for ordinary men like Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnowski and, and hundreds and thousands of, of warfighters, kids to me that I've met over the last 20 years, how little it takes them to go from being ordinary men rising to extraordinary circumstances. Let me put it that way. And I think we all have something in us that we don't know we have in us until we're faced with that kind of situation. And more times than not, and I've been in some hairy situations. I mean, I, I took a bullet in my leg in Afghanistan. I got blown off a helicopter in Iraq. I still have some shrapnel in my arm from Sarajevo. And more times than not, I've seen people who could be your neighbor, your grocer, your local cop, your fireman. I've seen them run towards the fighting and run away from the fighting. And it, it, it makes me, I don't want to get all sloppy patriotic on you, but it, it makes me feel good when I see whether it's, Older men, guys older than me, like Dick Benelli, the Marine at The Chosen, who gave me the idea for this book, or whether it's some 19-year-old kid, if they have it inside of you, then I think it's probably inside of me. And I think you could probably say the same thing about yourself. And I think most of your listeners could probably say the same thing about themselves. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. No, it makes perfect sense. It's a great way to end. Bob, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? You know what? I have an Amazon.com page. If you just go to Amazon.com and type in, in in the bar in the subject line, Bob Drury, all my books come up. In fact, I'm line editing. We have to do this again, Brett, because I just last week we handed in uh, our next one. will be out in October on Valley Forge. Oh, fantastic. You want to talk about the, the art of manliness, what those soldiers went yeah. through. My goodness gracious. But yes, Bob Drury on Amazon.com, and you'll see my work, and you'll even see a picture of me with my bald head. <laughs> well, Bob Drury, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Brett, thank you. Thank you for enjoying the book. My guest today was Bob Drury. He's the co-author of the book, Lucky 666. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Check out our show notes at aom.is slash lucky666, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.